a little Belfast. Uh, first of all, shout out to B Size. This uh, this is amazing seeing everyone here, and uh, I'm really excited and happy that I was asked to come out here. Also, um, uh, shout out to just to Belfast. I've never been here. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, uh, where it's 90 degrees Fahrenheit and 100 percent humidity, and it's not raining. <laughs> uh, and I won't say anything good about the weather here. <laughs> Uh, again, I'm Ray Kelly. Uh, I work at Synopsys. Many of you may not know the name Synopsys, but you're probably familiar with the tools, whether it be Coverity, Black Duck, or White Hat. Um, so that's our family there. Uh, I run our DAS R&D group, so I focus on automated uh, scanning technologies. How do we hack websites better, faster, more accurately? Uh, I've been a developer for around 25 years. Uh, I've been in AppSec for 20 years. Got my start in 2003 with a company called Spy Dynamics. Uh, you might know the uh, scanner web inspect, so I wrote most of that all through the 2000s, um, and that's where I got really started there. Uh, also, we went through a whole litany of acquisitions, <laughs> like uh, most cybersecurity companies. While I was at HP, uh, I ran our mobile pen test department. So we had a team of mobile pen testers, and a lot of the examples you'll see is from some of that experience, as well as things that have been publicly announced. A couple of considerations. So uh, everything I'm about to show you, I am showing you real hacks and such, things that we've seen. Uh, everything is either publicly disclosed or it's been scrubbed, so no zero days for any of you. And also, the other consideration is that these, are, uh, these aren't malicious people that I'm showing you. These weren't hackers that are exploiting these, uh, what we did while we were testing the applications. But these are really developers that have made mistakes in code that caused those vulnerabilities to happen. So keep that in mind, right? Uh, these aren't people that are trying to make insecure apps. They're trying to do their best. Talking about insecure devices, um, this is a bit of a stretch, but I like telling the story, so I'm going to tell it anyways. Uh, looking at a paper shredder. So back in the 70s, during the Cold War, uh, you know, Russia and America were having their beef going on. And uh, so in a hotel in Washington, D.C., where famous dignitaries would stay, whether you're presidents or your queen, uh, having to be there, they would usually stay at this one particular hotel. And in all of the rooms, they were kind enough to provide you with a paper shredder because you're important, you have classified documents, and you need to shred your papers while you're traveling. The problem, though, is that this particular paper shredder was made by a three-letter acronym of the U.S. government. <laughs> and what they had done is in the top of the shredder, right before it gets shredded, was a document scanner. And so as you're shredding your documents, it's scanning it and setting it over the electrical line uh, through like impulses, variating the, uh, the electrical current like an old school modem. And they were reconstructing the documents in another room of the hotel. I saw that, I was like, that is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, looking at the mobile landscape, um, mobile development is hot. I don't think I have to tell anyone that, right? Uh, unfortunately, because of that, security usually takes a back seat. Right, So we have developers, but you know what? You're getting your, your pressure from upper management, your product managers. Hey, we got to get that new feature in there. When are we shipping that app? Why is the review taking so long? Right, And so there's just constant pressure, and security is rarely, if ever, number one on the priority list. Right, um, So that's a big problem out there, where, why many things don't get caught. Uh, another uh, challenge is that mobile app development is relatively easy, right? Things like Cordova, you don't need to learn, uh, you don't have to understand Xcode, right? Horrible language, by the way, I don't know if anyone writes in that. Uh, but uh, it's, there are languages out there that make it really easy, almost drag and drop your application together, ship it up to the app store, and you're good to go, right? But did you think about security? No, it was easy, it was fast, <laughs> no problem. Um, the other problem is that uh, these vulnerabilities that the developers typically make are platform agnostic. So for instance, if my backend API is vulnerable to SQL injection, it doesn't matter if I'm on Android or iOS, right? It doesn't matter. Uh, so that's an, another challenge. The number of devices out there, again, don't think I need to tell you, 
but uh, they're exploding, right? Uh, and I know it might be hard to read, but 255 billion mobile app downloads uh, in, uh, was it last year? Let's see, uh, last year. 255 billion downloads, right, of applications that are going out, not knowing if they're secure or not. Looking at the mobile threat surface, uh, we did a study. Uh, we took 120 mobile applications uh, from a single customer. And I know that sounds crazy, but when you're dealing with large uh, corporations a lot of times, whether you're, uh, depending on what products you're selling, each product may have its own individual application written by different teams or different outsourced teams. Um, you know, it, it is quite possible. It sounds a little crazy, but it does happen. And we found that 66% of them contained a critical or a high vulnerability in those applications. And when we say critical or high, we're talking about it either disclosed uh, personal information through, say, like uh, third-party data leakage. I'll show examples of that. Um, or we were able to completely compromise the back-end system. So... Uh, again, many of you probably understand a lot about server side, you know, DAS, hacking the, that side of things. Uh, but there's two big differences uh, that need to be considered when looking at uh, mobile applications. One of them is the ex uh, magnified network exposure. And what I mean by that is Wi-Fi, right? I'm, you know, you take your phone around and you're getting on free public Wi-Fi at the airport. Is that really the airport's Wi-Fi? Uh, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, right? You don't know if they're uh, doing man in the middle, sniffing that traffic. So shady networks is definitely a problem. Magnified physical exposure, right? Uh, I have my phone here and I can leave it anywhere if someone nefarious person comes along or wants to, you know, steal my device for uh, information, they, they would be able to get that. And uh, since we're in a safe space here, right, I did this presentation in another place. I said, hey, you know, physical, and I reached and my phone's not there. I'm like, where's my phone? I left it on a table in the back while I was getting ready. <laughs> See, I meant to do that. <laughs> So the mobile threat surface, so when doing a pen test, when you want to analyze a mobile application, it, it's difficult, right? It's time consuming, it's tedious, and it makes it even harder when the developers actually do some good things, and, and we'll talk about that. But in general, you want to look at three areas when looking at a mobile application. We're looking at the client, again, on the device itself. Are we encrypting sensitive information? on the device with the data that your app is collecting, right? Um, poor certificate management. So things like that, actually looking on the device, what is happening, what's getting stored, what data is it accessing? We move over to the next level, the network. Okay, so we wanna look at the actual traffic that's going across the network to the backend API. Is it secure? That's one of the simplest things. <laughs> what kind of authentication is it using? Is there a third party uh, data leakage, right? Where's the data going? I'll show you an example of that as well. And lastly, we have the server side. So the back end, again, which is typically an API. It can be vulnerable to all the same things that all of you are familiar with, right? SQL injection, command injection. All of those things, and sometimes developers go, well, this is for a mobile app. What does it matter, right? It's just my app talking to that. You know, and I guarantee you bad people will find that API <laughs> and uh, be able to exploit those API calls. So what I'm going to do is go through some examples. And I'm going to start on the server side, okay? And again, like I said, that they are typically vulnerable to all the same DAS type findings that you're familiar with. Um, one thing is that, again, young developers or people not familiar with security, they're like, well, this is an API endpoint. You can't Google that, right? I, I, I can't search for, you know, my backend endpoint. It typically won't come up. It doesn't get indexed by Google. But the bad guys will find that endpoint, guaranteed. So you need to be sure that, you know, sanitize your inputs. All the same rules happen on the back end. Uh, this particular example was one we actually uh, performed. 
So we had a mobile app that talked to the backend API. Unfortunately, on the API end, they had WebDAV enabled and they allowed the put method. So essentially, we could upload any file we wanted to to their backend server. We were able to turn it into like a OneDrive for, <laughs> for anyone we wanted to. Or upload a, a nefarious link, right? Click your and evil tickets on this particular website. And then what I'm going to do is spam that to millions of people. Hey, we got tickets here using this third party, uh, API, basically. Click here to win tickets. And when you click that, of course, it's going to take you to some ransomware or some other bad stuff, right? To go and infect, say, like your computer. So, uh, again, in this case, they were not protecting that any upload, arbitrary upload of any file could happen on this. British Airways, this might be sensitive to some. It's okay over in, in the U.S. when I talk about this. Um, so they were, they had a problem. They uh, got hit by the MageCart skimmer. Anyone familiar with MageCart? So essentially it's a JavaScript, uh, it's a malicious piece of JavaScript that basically what it does when you fill out your credit card information on a website, it will take that. It not only submits it to, you know, British Airways in this case, but we'll send a copy of that to the bad guy server, right? All of that same information. Um, I'm not sure what the entry point was for this vulnerability, but it ended up on their server somehow. So this happened to have gotten expanded though, because on the mobile app, it was a HTML5 based application and it pulled its JavaScript files from that, that server. So now we went from one uh, you know, one hacked website to who, um, how many mobile app users are there for uh, British Airways, right? 100,000. Anybody that was buying tickets on their phone, that same information was getting sent up to the bad guy server, all the credit card information. Uh, and they were stealing things like email addresses, uh, credit card numbers, expiration dates, the CDB number, right? All of that information. And I just thought that was interesting that you know, one vulnerable web server ended up infecting how many, how many, uh, different mobile apps. If I'm not mistaken, this was the first, uh, or almost, I, I'm pretty sure it was the first instance of a GDPR fine that happened. And they were hit with a $190 million fine based on that. Um, and again, I believe that's based on either what revenue of the corporation or the amount of data that was stolen. And somehow they whittled that down to 20 million, I guess, because they maybe didn't realize when GDPR came out how costly it could actually be if this happened. And unfortunately, British Airways was the first ones to figure that out. When I saw that, I was like, wow, that's kind of interesting, right? It, my uh, Delta mobile app has all kinds of information, passport number, right? All of my information is in there. So I had my team do a study. Hey, let's download as many uh, airplane, you know, airline apps as we can and take a look at it. Now, we couldn't actually legally attack those, say, like endpoints, um, but we were able to do binary analysis, right? Anyone can take a, take a mobile app and take a look at it. And when we did, I know it's hard to read, but we were able to find things like weak crypto. We found things like uh, basic authentication was being used <laughs> between uh, endpoints. Uh, let me see. Unsafe, you know, they didn't pin their certificate, uh, the SSL certificate in the application. Um, weak certificate signing, third party data leakage. We found all kinds of things that were in these applications just by binary analysis, not actually poking on, say, like the back end. Um, and we can see I have it split up between iOS and Android. Uh, usually when we get to the questions pe area, people say, okay, so what's more secure, Android or iOS? And again, like I said at the beginning, these are platform agnostic, right? The back end, it doesn't matter if you're on Android or iOS, or if in my code in the mobile app, I'm concatenating strings to build my SQL query, right? For SQL injection. That has nothing to do with the OS. That's purely in code where that happens. Another example on server side, this one came out on the press. Uh, there was an application called Bright City. And what this app did, um, so it was a way that a homeowner or anyone 
you could go around and take pictures of your valuables and what they would. So if there was an accident, say like a, uh, your house burned down or a natural disaster, it would catalog everything that's in your house. So you can go to the insurance company and say, look, I really did have diamond rings. I really did have a big screen TV and keep all of that for those purposes. Uh, the problem came up though, where the backend API and it's probably, again, it's kind of small, hard to read, but, uh, which one? Um, not working, but anyways, in the, uh, uh, in the URL to the API, uh, the last parameter, or you can see the, the method called get user, and then there was an ID there. And the ID is something like 1000. Well, what happens if I hit 1001? This huge chunk of data comes back for the next person that's, that uses the application. So right there, we're doing account enumeration, right? We're just walking through all of those accounts. The really bad part, though, is within this information, cell phone number, email, date of birth, username, and password <laughs> for the account. So now we have access to everybody's information. We can get into any account uh, just by simply enumerating it, the accounts on the backend API. Again, this is for a mobile application, but the backend is the thing that's vulnerable here. Uh, I call it Amazon for criminals. Like if I, I need a new big screen TV, let me go through and see what I can find who lives nearby, right? And uh, go rob the house. Next, um, now we're going to move into the network area, right? The network section. Things we're looking for is like third party data leakage, clear text data, not using SSL. So in this example here, and it is blurry because there's a lot of sensitive information here and a lot of even on top of redacted information. Um, so we had this application. It was for a big time boy band. Like think of like new kids on the block. Any fans? New kids? No? Okay. We got one. Okay. We got two over here. <laughs> so you can figure their target demographic is like teenage girls for this particular band. And so we were testing the application. The tester was man in the middle, right? So they were using a proxy server, physically using the application, created an account, and he's watching the traffic through the proxy log. And he sees a chunk of data go by and it kind of caught his eye and he's looking at it. And he sees his home address in there in that data going to the backend API. And he was thinking like, I didn't put my home address in here. What's going on? And what the application we determined was doing was using GPS coordinates to narrow down the actual home address, taking that and uploading it to the backend server. So they were collecting or harvesting home addresses of these people. And, um, you know, was, is that a vulnerability? I mean, certainly it's private information, but did anyone read the EULA? Who does? Who knows? Sort of that iffy situation. Did they mean to do that? It's very possible they didn't, right? They may have been just using GPS for something and didn't mean to even collect that information. Um, so that one was, was uh, a little bit shady. We, we, we did flag that as an issue. Um, again, even if the EULA or if they intended to do it, it's probably not a great idea. So we did flag that as an issue. So, uh, like I was explaining, it's, it's kind of, again, it's difficult to do this testing, right? There's a lot of, you have to physically use the app. You have to get man in the middle, pen test the back end. So I was thinking, how can we make this easier? We, we got, cause it takes a lot of time, right? And again, the cost, there are people are under pressure. Hey man, let's ship this. Um, so I thought, well, Android is somewhat open source. Why don't I make my own OS? So what I did is I took Android, a version of Android, the source code, went in uh, and modified several of the files in there where things like uh, network communication, so like the uh, um, java.net, right? Anything that happens within that library, I said, hey, take that traffic and also send it over here to something that I have a little, mo I built a monitor to see what happens. And that way, when you're using the app, it's actually spitting out everything before it gets encrypted to the back end server. So we can kind of map out the back end if we don't have, you know, if we don't have a definition of that. It was also storing things like uh, anything, any file rights would also get spit out and we can see what was being uh, stored, see if it was encrypted and such. 
Um, so I created this thing, got it all going. It seemed like it was kind of working. I was like, okay, let's give this thing. Let's, let's really put it to the test. So I, uh, and it was on the emulator. So it, basically you just installed this, uh, I called it shadow OS in the emulator and then you could drop any app on it. And now I can see exactly what it's doing as you're exercising it. And I put it on there. I took a popular, we'll just say social networking companies app, dumped it on here and started exercising it. And immediately I see this huge hunk of data, you know, this big mess go out over the network. Like, ah, oh, what did I break? What is this all about? And I start looking at it and I'm seeing crazy stuff in here, like rear camera, true, front camera, false, key guard type, Wi-Fi enabled, uh, screen brightness, how much disk space is free on the device. All of this was just being harvested off the device. Um, and sent up. And again, did you get permission for that? I, you know, questionable. <laughs> um, and I was kind of thinking, why would this even be important? Anyone want to take a, a shot at why somebody would want this information about your device? What's that? Uh, I don't know about fingerprinting, but that's a good thought. It could be that. And I don't know the exact answer. I have a hunch. It's one option. Uh, the kind of the thing that I went down is, you know, if my free disk space is low, all of a sudden within my feed, here comes an advertisement, right? Hey, you need a new SD card, <laughs> uh, you know, and like be able to target you while you're using your device in certain situations, you know, targeted advertising. Um, and I'm sure they, you know, companies sell this data all the time just to other, other folks. But I thought that was an interesting uh, way to go about that. Uh, also on the network, uh, Bose headphones, uh, they were also outed as well. So nowadays, you know, you can't use your headphones without a mobile app. You got to have that. Uh, yeah, that's different. I won't go into that story, but, uh, so Bose, what they were doing was actually collecting your listening app. They were taking what you were listening to. Okay. Um, and it, that, doesn't sound terrible, but when I saw this quote, um, it really stuck out, uh, stuck with me. Uh, the complaint accuses Boston-based Bose of violating the Wiretap Act in a variety of state privacy laws, adding that a person's audio history can include a window into a person's life and views. That based on my, what I'm listening to, that people can you know make assumptions. Again, maybe targeted advertising or, or who knows what they want with that. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, for me, I like big hair rock music. I think the only thing they get out of that is I have horrible taste in music. Uh, Starbucks mobile app. This made a big splash. Um, this, this one's pretty old. Uh, they had, their application was also HTML5 based. So what they were doing is they were using Crashlytics, right? Just another one of the hundreds of types of analytic uh, data capturing services, right? Third party. So what they had done was they were capturing screens, you know, just so because they wanted to track what screens are people going to and such. And for whatever reason, they were actually uploading the HTML content to Crashlytics uh, with that data. The problem here, though, is they were uploading it after the user name, the user typed in their username and password. So now Crashlytics ended up having everybody's username and password for Starbucks in that case. Um, so again, that's, that's an example of a third party data leakage. Uh, I thought this was interesting when the, when the uh, quote came out. Uh, when reached Wednesday, Crashlytics, a Boston based firm that specializes in crash reporting solutions, couldn't comment on specific customers, but they did reiterate that the firm doesn't recommend developers log sensitive information. So, what's the fix? Don't do that. <laughs> Client side logging. So um, anyone can do this actually with your with a mobile app. If you have um, Xcode installed, uh, you can open up the developer console. Uh, I'm not. They keep changing the name. I'm not sure what it's called right now. But uh, you know, you plug in your device, Xcode, open the console up, and you'll see all kinds of information flying through there. Right, a lot of data regarding the OS itself, um, and then developers that you're writing code. You know, log.debug a certain thing, well, that's where that shows up. 
And a lot of times developers won't remove those log messages. Okay, so we did see examples where we could see usernames and passwords being thrown out into the device log. Um, and again, that's probably the developer at the time just saying, you know what, the, my login isn't working. Let me just output some log information so I can see what's happening here. And they don't remove that before uploading it to say like the App Store or Google Play. Um, so logging is also another area to look at. So in this case, uh, we were handed a banking application. And uh, this was, uh, this was a, a while ago, and um, kind of when banking applications really started hitting, hitting the market. And it was sort of a new feature, right? Taking a, a doing a mobile deposit, deposit. Anyone do mobile deposits uh, with their banking uh, with the phone? And in this case, what we found that they were doing is when you take a picture of the check, it was storing it to the global camera roll of the device, which all applications have access to, right? It wasn't in the sandbox where that data should be stored. And so, you know, we flagged that, hey, bang. They had handed it to us and said, hey, we're in a hurry. We need to get this out. And like, okay, you know, give us some time. We tested. So we reported that and said, look, don't ship this. you got a critical vulnerability. We, we think you should fix this. So we sent it back. They come back like a day or two later saying, we fixed the issue. We're all good now. And by the way, we just pushed this up into the app store. Okay, we'll check and make sure it's fixed, but uh, you know, we'll do that. So we take it. We look at it. They did fix it. They fixed that problem when you make the deposit. We found, though, that they had another feature where you could go through everything that went through your account by swiping through the images. And as you swipe, it's writing each one of those back to the global camera roll, everything that's been through your account. Uh, and when we go back and like, no, they ended up having to pull that, uh, you know, pull it out of review and go back and start all over again. And I just cannot stress enough how much pressure, I know, I know we're all hardcore, right? We're all security guys. Hey, we know what's best, but developers are under pressure to push those features out and product managers um, by executives to get these things out. And security, in this case, they're just like, look, we're, we pushed it up. We're hoping for the best. And those are the type of pressures the developers are under. And I think most of us probably have an understanding of that. You know, we see dumb stuff all the time, but there's usually a reason, right? Client-side debug screens. Uh, this one's really interesting. So a lot of times there'll be a debug screen embedded in an application that you never see, that you actually, you know, the apps that you download from the store, the screen's in there, but it's not enabled. Usually it's, say, like a build flag uh, that would enable that or not. Um, or if you have admin credentials, let's say, or certain types of credentials, that screen will show up. But there are tools that allow you to modify in memory uh, on the device to be able to set different flags that you can see based on variable names. You know, if your code isn't obfuscated, then you can see some of these variable names and kind of play with them and tweak them. And these are some of the examples of the things we saw in where, again, normal people shouldn't see these screens. And uh, I, again, I know it's hard to read, uh, but let's see, there's a flag there for disable SSL certificate pinning. Fantastic. Um, we have upload log file in this particular application. We looked at that and it wasn't just upload log file. You could use that endpoint to upload anything you wanted, right? It didn't even validate that the file was coming from the application itself. It was just a wide open, again, server to upload any files you want to. Uh, this example over here has, um, you can pick your server and it has production, right? It also has staging and canary. So as an attacker, that just gave me two more assets, right? Two more targets that I can go hit that are probably less secure on the back end uh, for me to probably, you know, hopefully gain access into the network or hit it with SQL injection because surely it's probably not as fortified as the production server. Um, so again, it's just a way to harvest more information as a pen tester or as a bad guy to figure out more ways to steal data or get into, into the servers. Uh, this one was one of my favorites. So uh, we tested an application 
And it was so secure that it used voice recognition to log into the app. So what you would do is you start up the app, and when you set it up, you would say anything you wanted uh, to log in. You know, I could say asparagus, and if that's what I recorded, it worked. And we would hand it around to other people, other pen testers, you know, we'd say carrots or whatever, right? And it worked. It was really good. No one else, even if someone else said asparagus, it didn't work. Okay, so it was pretty good voice recognition. One of the techniques for uh, pen testing mobile apps is to take a look at the directory where the files stored, right? So if you're not familiar, that's where plist is stored. Um, all of your uh, files that your application needs will be put in a folder just like on a normal PC for that to work. And what you do is you take a snapshot of, of that and say, okay, here's what the directory looks like now. Maybe there's 10 files in there. Now I open the app, I do asparagus, right? And I exercise the application, I do things, I'm trying it out, great. Now I go back and look at the directory again and I see 12 files. Okay, cool. Uh, now that's interesting to me. What are those two files? <laughs> and uh, one of them made no sense. And it was something like zebra.xyz made no sense. Okay, well, whatever. All right, let's, let's throw it into Notepad and just see what happens, right? Or, or a hex editor and see. And it looks like garbage, complete binary stuff. Like, okay, not sure. But as we look closer near the top, we see things like genre, year, Artist. Anyone? MP3. So what we did is we took that file, pulled it off onto the computer, renamed it to MP3, held the phone up, hit play, asparagus, it opens up. <laughs> so an example of security through obscurity, right? That, hey, I'm just going to rename this file and no one will ever figure it out. And uh, so that, was a, that one was pretty clever in that case. Resources. Uh, OWASP is a great resource. They have the mobile application security testing guide uh, on there. Uh, they also have, is that on the next one? Uh, no, they don't. They have uh, several mobile applications that you can use that's, you know, like WebGo, right, or JuShop uh, that are mobile apps for iOS and Android that you can actually try this and walk through the guide and see all these different ways to uh, find vulnerabilities in mobile applications. They also have the mobile, uh, OWASP mobile top 10, uh, you know, the top 10 vulnerabilities for mobile applications. Uh, so that they are a great resource as well. Okay, with that, uh, I'll take some questions. Um, if I don't know the answer, I'll pretend like I didn't understand your language. And we'll see what goes on. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, Just, could you repeat the question? Oh, Does sure, absolutely. Yes, we have a question. Yes, yes. So uh, the, he was asking about the account enumeration. Like I said, it had date of birth, username, and password uh, that you could see. And actually, it wasn't plain text. It was over SSL. It, so it was secure. But at, at the endpoint, right, where we're at and we're querying that data back, it, it's clear text to you, right? You, you just went over the SSL connection. Um, again, kind of the thing like, oh, it's over SSL, it's safe. Well, you just sort of hit all your networking <laughs> devices from seeing me steal all that information. Um, so. Uh, sure. so we talked about um, logging and logging vulnerabilities. And when we talk about the service side, <clears throat> one of the vulnerabilities we often discuss is log injection. That. Um, when you're logging um, logs locally on the phone, how bad is if there is a log injection? Yeah, when it's uh, uh, so the question is about that logging issue that I had talked about. That one is, um, as far as for a nefarious person, it's not that bad, right? Because it's on the device. So, like, you have to have the device to see that information. But as a pen tester, right, that's incredibly useful to us to see some information that's being spit out in those logs. Um, but to use it for bad stuff, is, it, it's, the risk level is pretty low because you actually have to get physical access to that device. Um, hopefully that kind of answers your, your question. And I guess to answer that question, where those logs are stored in the device, like what, what's the probability that another malicious device would have access to the log 
Exactly. So, uh, so other applications. So, a good example is Angry Birds, right? How many fake ang Angry Birds <laughs> applications were created? Um, so, they were made in China typically. And uh, when you jailbreak or root your device, all bets are off, right? So, I can install that, you know, siloed applications onto there, my, my free Angry Birds app. But in reality, what it's doing is going through those logs on the device or going through your global camera roll and stealing all that information and uploading it to the bad guy server. Um, so that's an example where that could happen. Yes? So which one's more secure than Android? <laughs> <laughs> None of them. I, I would say, though, um, so I had a mobile application that was fairly popular. It was Minecraft-related. Um, and I would upload it to both Android and iOS. I, I think I, uh, Apple did a better job of making sure that the app was somewhat secure. I know they did like blacklist testing to make sure any URLs that are embedded within your app don't have blacklisted URLs. Um, and it would usually take a week for the review. I don't know if they were actually working on it or what's going on. I do know that people actually used it. I would get emailed by their assessment team saying, hey, we tried your username and password and it didn't work. Someone was actually trying to use the app in, on Apple's team, or I was getting fished. But um, <laughs> uh, and on Android, uh, it was usually up within an hour. It just apps ready, you know. So I, I so I don't know if that means it's better or not. But that, that's my one takeaway I could really give you. I think there, yeah, uh, one way, way in the back. <laughs> Yeah, so the question about facial recognition, I don't have an answer for that. Hopefully someone does, and I hope it's secure because I use it all the time because um, uh, I hate typing in passwords and trying to remember them, but uh, I, I don't have any information on that. Yes? Uh, outside of uh, social media, um, what genre of category of app in your experience collects the most uh, intrusive? I, I don't know, I don't have data on that, like which application would collect the most intrusive data, what classification or, you know, industry, and I don't, I, I think it's just completely up to each application or each organization that's shipping those apps uh, as to what they want to collect off the device, right, and, and every app is just different. I've seen from a whole lot to nothing, right, so I, I'm not sure uh, if there's really a category. Just a bit off that one. Um... Do you have any recommendations on uh, how to check that information or just kind of up to the developers? It's up to the, yeah, that's a great point about protecting yourself. I, and I do media inquiries all the time, right, through Synopsys. I'll, we'll get hit up when there's a zero day that comes out, like last week on iOS, right, that a malicious image or PDF causes command execution on your device, <laughs> opens you up to, uh, to uh, command, uh, command injection. And the question is, okay, so what do users do? Don't use your device, you know, I mean, what can you do, right? That's in the OS, right? Or if it's a developer mistake, you, you, most of the time you don't even know, actually. So there's not a lot that a user can do. I know there's like scanners that look for, you know, malicious Angry Birds apps, more so for Android, but a lot of times those will be malicious too. <laughs> so I don't know if I can rec even recommend that. My time? Couple minutes. Anything else? Yes. You know the login application you talked about the one where you ask your uh any like the new thing through development package. Yes. Yes, yeah, so it kind of. <laughs> um I moved out of the pen testing group back into the DAS world when while I was doing that. The intent was to open source it. And it is on GitHub, publicly available, uh, VB is best. Uh, I usually, that's usually the first question. Is your handle really VB is best? <laughs> um, yes, it is. And um, so it is up there, and I have some documentation about what it does and such, and a couple of modified Android files. I'm sure they're out of date now. I can't remember what Android version it was. I would like to get back to that, though, and, and try to get that back working again. Um, so that is up there uh, called Shadow OS. Um, hopefully I can get back to that because that was a really cool tool. You just start exercising the app and the little monitor will show you, hey, this file got written. Hey, this request just went out. Even over SSL, and show you the request, the response. 
Um, and there was something else he did, but I can't remember. Oh, I think it was log, watching the logs that are getting spit out from that application specifically that you're testing. So hopefully I'll get back to it. Yeah, so uh, one of the we talked about SSL certificate pinning. Uh, if the developer doesn't do that, you can simply proxy. Just run, tie your uh, your device through a proxy burp, if you will, um, and just watch the traffic go through. That's all you have to do. Um, you might be thinking, well, why not? Why don't developers pin the certificates? Why don't they fingerprint them? Make sure that the thing I'm talking to is really what I'm supposed to be talking to. And the challenge there usually is testing, that you have a QA department, you have a QA lab, right? And they don't want to buy a certificate for that, right? They want to use self-signed certs, whatever. But to do that, you need to disable pinning in the application or in the function call. Usually it's like on certificate validation, for example, return true. <laughs> hey, it's just always good. No problem. And then the testers are all happy. Oh, thank you. That's great. And then they ship it to the app store without undoing that. Um, ideally, that should be a build flag <laughs> that I have a debug build that will allow that. But when I we do a release build, that certificate pinning is re-enabled again uh, to prevent that. But a lot of the times, that'll just slip through and they just don't catch it. Uh, so I guess I'll end it there. I, uh, I'm here all day and hopefully at the after party. I love talking DAST. I love talking, uh, pen testing. So please come up. I like to meet everyone and everyone here in Belfast has been amazingly friendly. I've had a great time here. So thank you all. Thank you.